Harry here. Welcome to our Lenten study, Who Do You Say That I Am? A Faith and Incarceration Lenten series. I do want to let folks know that this is adapted from curriculum from Catholic Prison Ministries. I have just shaped it just a little bit more than what they did, but it is largely from them, and I really appreciate the work that they have done. Session one is on stats to stories. It's about incarceration and families. Let's pray. Good and loving God, our source of love and light, thank you for bringing us together today in a spirit of generosity. May we honor one another by keeping an open mind May we voice our truth and listen with an open heart. May we discern your will to unite in fruitful outcome. We ask for your wisdom and grace to use our talents for the betterment of others. With gratitude, we offer this prayer in your name. Amen. So I just want to welcome everyone to this uh, virtual reality space. Um, I'm Terry Stewart. I am the Director of Chaplains at King County, and I am the Religious Coordinator at Echo Glen. All that comes under my role as the Steward of Connection at Circle Faith Future, and our program is called Youth Rise. I hope that uh, you feel free to leave comments in underneath the video when it comes time to do that uh, at any time and respect the space and honor one another's comments there so there will be no room for hateful comments at all. And maybe if you want to, what would be really great is if in the comments you could just put a note about why you wanted to watch this. Um, we are, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a roadmap for the evening, or today, sorry, it's my evening, you could be watching at any time. We're going to talk about the high level statistics about incarceration and how it, uh, its effects in the United States. We're going to go through a reflection that can give us a glimpse into the impact that incarceration has on a family. And then maybe look at some resources or talk about getting some resources to learn more and some action steps about what we can do individually or as a community. So let's go on. America has incarcerated more persons in the world than any other nation. Over the past several decades, our country has built the largest prison population in the world. The U.S. has 4% of the world's population, but 22% of the world's incarcerated population. We lock up a greater proportion of our citizens than repressive regimes like Pakistan, Russia, China, or Cuba. Who are incarcerated? People of color who face much greater rates of poverty are dramatically overrepresented in the nation's prisons and jails. These racial disparities are particularly stark for black Americans who make up 40% of the incarcerated population, despite being only 13% of the U.S. residents. The same is true for women whose incarceration rates have for decades risen faster than men and who are often behind bars because of financial obstacles such as an inability to pay a bill. What are the losses of those who are incarcerated? Poverty, for example, plays a central role in mass incarceration. People in prison and jail are disproportionately poor compared to the overall U.S. population, and poverty plays a central role in mass incarceration. People in prison and jail are disproportionately poor compared to the overall U.S. population. The criminal justice system punishes poverty beginning with the high price of a money bail. The, the average felony bail bond is about $10,000, and that's the equivalent of eight months income for a typically detained defendant. Poverty is not only predictor of incarceration, it also uh, free, uh, increases the frequency and it frequently predicts the outcome. 
as a criminal record and time spent in prison destroy wealth, create debt, and decimates job opportunities. The loss of a parent to incarceration can bring on trauma and disruption for the whole family. And most of us don't experience that without uh, having serious consequences in our life. This loss often makes greater or compounds or exacerbates existing environmental stress like poverty, poor schools, and violent neighborhoods. An estimated 684,500 state and federal prisoners were parents of at least one minor child in 2016. So about 626,800 or 47% males and 57,700 which is 58% females in state or federal prison were parents with minor children. Prisoners reported having an estimated 1,473,700 minor children. 47% state prisoners and 57% of federal prisoners have at least one minor child. One point five million children under the age of 17 have a parent in prison. 18.2% for the state and 12.7% for the federal or nation with a parent in prisons were age one to four years old. 32.8% for the state and 31.1% for federal prisons have a parent in prison. Uh, the children are five to nine years old. The uh, above 1.5 million people surveyed does not include the nearly 1 million others incarcerated in local county jails, county juvenile detention centers, and other forms of incarceration. More than 5 million kids in the United States have had a parent in jail or prison at some point during their childhood. Over-incarceration tears families apart without making us safer. There's a quote from Damien Eccles. Prison is designed to separate, isolate, and alienate you from everyone and everything. You're not allowed to do so much as touch your spouse, your parents, or your children. The system does everything within its power to sever any physical or emotional links you have to anyone in the outside world. They want your children to grow up without ever knowing you. They want your spouse to forget your face and start a new life. They want you to sit alone, grieving in a concrete box, unable even to say your last farewell at a parent's funeral. The impact of incarceration on families. Mental health and homelessness. Incarceration imposes a unique burden on families with children and the trauma that these families experience leads to a wide range of negative impacts such as reduced earnings, housing instability or homelessness, poorer schools outcomes, and mental health issues. It also reinforces existing social inequalities. Trauma. The trauma of having an immediate family member incarcerated exacts a heavy toll on the physical and mental health of parents, spouses, and children. Incarceration fails to address substance use and mental health issues for either the person who has been incarcerated or their loved ones. For example, one of the institutions I'm in has one therapist for 80 people. 63% of women with a loved one incarcerated report a mental health impact, and more than 33% have reported homelessness or other housing insecurities. Every second, the impact of incarceration crisis on Americans' families, you can find the, a document there at everysecond.fwd.us forward slash downloads forward slash every second.fwd.us.pdf. Reentry and recidivism. 
Reunion entry is the transition process of someone returning to a community after incarceration. A returning citizen is a term that refers to the person who was incarcerated who's now going back to the community after incarceration. And recidivism is a broad term that refers to re-offending or being re-arrested or re-convicted and re-incarceration. It could be a supervision violation such as a probation or parole violation. And it's calculated widely differently across uh, the states. So uh, a calculation for Florida is probably not the same as in Washington. So it's really important to look at how they each state measures things when you're talking about the broad, uh, broad recidivism rates. Um, so is it a one year recidivism rate, three year recidivism rate? How do they measure it? So the recidivism among persons released from state prisons in 2008 across 24 states, 82% were arrested at least once during the 10 years following re release. The annual arrest percentage declines over time with 43% of prisoners arrested at least once in year one of their release, 29% in year five, and 22% by year 10. Indicators, of course, that would lead towards uh, re-offending are poor social and economic environments, uh, circumstances that uh, were there before they were incarcerated and they go back to the same environment, a difficulty in transitioning, barriers to employment or housing, and troubled family relationships. Re-entry. One of the reasons the rate of recidivism is so high is the lack of support for those who are leaving incarceration. Re-entry programs can play a crucial role in reducing recidivism. Without such support, we run the risk of further marginalizing those who are already marginalized. And here are some ways to combat recidivism and support our returning citizens. citizens. Mental health and substance use. Uh, not substance use, but substance use counseling. So supporting those things, uh, better housing, accessible housing, employment opportunities, connecting people with faith communities, but really not just faith communities, just connecting people to communities, giving legal support, providing education, doing training or technical assistance, helping people figure out things, and advocating for change and better laws in our environment. Uh, Heath uh, Buckmaster says, it's not about becoming a new person, but becoming the person you were meant to be and already are, but don't know how to be or haven't been permitted to be. In her own words, one of the worst parts of growing up with a father in and out of prison was the isolation and shame I felt. It cost my whole family, particularly my mother who was left to raise two small children alone. Felicity Rose, from every second that I referenced this, uh, this um, web address earlier, the everysecond.fwd.us. So we're gonna have a tough conversation as much as we can. You can post in the comments or I have provided a link to a form uh, that you can put some answers to some questions in that uh, will take you deep into a deeper uh, reflection. You can use your camera to scan the QR code and that'll take you also straight to the form. So this is about Jack, Cheryl and their family. Jack is 24 years old. He and his wife, Cheryl, who is also 24, have been together since high school. They have two children. BJ is five and Kyla is two. Jack is the main source of income for the family. Cheryl has been a stay-at-home mom since BJ came along. Jack was arrested with a couple of older college friends for operating a meth lab. He is sentenced to 15 years in state prison. The prison is located 105 miles away from his home. 
this scenario is after his arrest and after his trial, so he is convicted. Cheryl tries to explain to BJ what will happen next. So let's just think of some of the questions that BJ might ask. What would you ask if you were a tiny child? Just think about that for a minute. Maybe you can leave something in the comments. When is daddy coming home? Will daddy be here for my birthday? What about Christmas? Is daddy safe? Will we have to go live in prison with dad? When can we go and visit him? Some of BJ's friends have stopped calling him for playdates like they used to. Cheryl is looking at the prospects of no real income, a single parent raising two young children. Some of the follow-up questions that you'll find linked on the form that I referenced are here. How do you feel about seeing or experiencing that scenario? Have you experienced a conversation similar to what we uh, just went through with Jack and his family? Do you know someone who has had a similar experience to Jack? How have they described their experience? And what would a faith response to this look like? Where can people of faith, communities of faith, step in? So here's some resources and action that you can do. And first, I would just say pray. Uh, pray for the people in prison, pray for all the decision makers, pray for the policy makers. Your faith, if you're a person of faith, your faith tells you to pray, to take it to God. Advocate and learn. So spend some time educating yourself about policies and step into the advocacy arena by encouraging your lawmakers to make better laws that are strongly based in evidence-based practices and are humane and lead towards restoration, not simply towards punishment. Volunteer for prison ministries uh, or on the outside so you can volunteer directly at a prison or juvenile detention center, or you can volunteer to help families affected by incarceration or youth affected by incarceration. You can volunteer at food banks because the intersection of those who don't have food and those who go to prison is pretty strong. Keep yourself informed. Find resources of information about incarceration that you trust. The Prison Policy Initiative is a good source of information. Now that we spent some time with the facts around incarceration and reflected on the experience of those affected by the incarceration system, let's just take a few minutes to look inward and create a space to listen to God's voice. And examine it just grounds our reflection and it has us examine our own self in, uh, in the context of our faith. I'm going to leave space as I read each line for you to read it also to yourself. Compassionate God, maker of us all. I confess my own share in the ills of our times. Have mercy on me. Jesus Christ, companion of all prisoners. I confess my own share in the ills of our times. Have mercy on me. Holy Spirit, healer of wounds. I confess my own share in the ills of our times. Have mercy on me.
So I'd like you to just sit with these questions for a while. Maybe you can write something in the comments or if you want to just uh, scribble down some notes for yourself. We're going to take about 30 seconds to a minute for each question. It's okay if you don't get anything written down or typed in, but I'm going to go through them in that way. What are some of the ills I see throughout my community? Do I know someone who has been or is incarcerated? What is my relationship to them? What are a few adjectives that come to my mind when I think of someone who is incarcerated? What do I sense God encouraging in me during this time? We're going to go through the examine one more time after our reflection has been done and uh, we offer our thoughts and our reflections to God, our Creator, and Christ, our Redeemer, as we pray again. Compassionate God, maker of us all, I confess my own share in the ills of our times. Have mercy on me. Jesus Christ, companion of all prisoners, I confess my own share in the ills of our times. Have mercy on me. Holy Spirit, healer of wounds, I confess my own share in the ills of our time. Have mercy on me. Let's pause for a moment of silence and reflect on how our fears or indifference may have contributed to the incarceration crisis in our communities and our country.
I confess my own share in the ills of our times. Have mercy on me. Amen. Now we'll close to this prayer by Menoling Francisco. Where there is fear, I can allay. Where there is pain, I can heal. Where there are wounds, I can bind. And hunger, I can fill. Lord, grant me courage. Lord, grant me strength. Grant me compassion that I may be your heart today. Where there is hate, I can confront. Where there are yokes, I can release. Where there are captains, I can free, and anger I can appease. Lord, grant me courage. Lord, grant me strength. Grant me compassion, that I may be your heart today. When comes the day I dread to see our broken world, protect me from myself grown cold, that your people I may behold. And when I've done all that I could, yet there are hearts I cannot move. Lord, give me hope that I may be your heart today. Amen. I look forward to seeing you for the second lesson in about a week.